Um, it's 6.30, so we'll begin this meeting of the Licensing Committee. Um, first of all, the fire evacuation procedures. There are no fire alarms scheduled for this evening. Therefore, if the fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the building immediately. The fire exits are located at the rear and side of this room. Go down the stairs and meet in the War Memorial Park. Next, to note that the open proceedings of the meeting are webcast. Uh, next, to ask that mobile phones are switched off or put to silent. Um, apologies. I have two apologies for absence from Councillor Mark Raffel and Councillor Sven Godeson. Do we have any others? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm replacing Colin Regan tonight. Thank you, Councillor Hood. Um, and no other apologies? Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any declarations of conflicts of interest? Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I need to declare an interest on the items on the catboarding and also the item on um, dog daycare and creche, and I will need to uh, leave the room for this. Thank you. Any other declarations of interest? No? Okay, thank you. Um, I have no urgent items. Um, next, to confirm the minutes of the meeting. Um, they were sent to you separately and they're also in front of you. And um, that's for the 25th of March. Are they agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, right, the first thing I have to do is to um, see to an election of a vice chair for this committee. Do I have nominations? Councillor Reid. Um, I'd like to nominate Councillor Rita Burgess. I'd like to second it. Thank you very much. Are there any other nominations? Thank you. So it's just Mrs. Burgess. I think that's carried. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Would you like to come and join me so you can keep me on the straight and narrow? Thank you. Right. While she's doing that, um, we'll just talk about the member and public participation upon issues that contained in the agenda. Um, we will, as usual, be calling you forward um, at the appropriate time. I understand we've got Mr. Dinning. Yes, and you'll be talking about advertising and the fees. And Mr. Gillooly, which one will you be speaking to? The enforcement report. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll call you forward at the appropriate time. Um, now, there are no referrals from other committees, the council or cabinet. So we'll, we'll move to the business um, on the agenda. Now, just to say that we slightly juggled with the order so that our speakers can do their bit first and then go home. Um, so what, we, what we've done is, uh, this is the order in which we're going to take it. First of all, we'll, we'll be doing paper F, which is advertising on Hackneys and PHVs. Then we'll be doing paper C, which are the fees and charges. Then paper E, which is the enforcement report. Those are the three that we have speakers for. Um, then we'll have the update on the shared services with Hart. And finally, we'll de deal with B and G, the cats and the dogs. Okay, so by that time, we'll all be asleep. Okay, right, so let's start then with paper F, which is advertising on licensed vehicles, and it's Andrew to introduce. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this paper is to consider um, the advertising permissions for licensed vehicles um, and to formalise an advertising policy. Earlier this year, the committee considered a request to allow external advertising on licensed private hire vehicles and requested further detail be provided. Um, Appendix 1 shows the subsequent proposal which is put forward by a private hire operator um, who is also the proprietor of a fleet of licensed vehicles. We license various different styles of vehicles for private hire use. Within Appendix 1, members can see the areas of those different vehicle types the operator uh, wishes to advertise on and the suggested conditions and guidance to support this proposal. In summary, this seeks to allow advertising of commercial services and products on the rear side panels and boots and the rear side windows and back windscreen. Private hire vehicles are currently limited to promoting their own operator de details only. They are required by condition to carry corporate livery to ensure ease of identification as licensed vehicles by the public. Hackney carriage vehicles are permitted to advertise in full wrap style, um, that's all of the vehicle, and we control the advertising content by pre-approval. 
The difference in permissions is based on how distinctive hackney carriage vehicle types are as purpose-built wheelchair accessible vehicles and therefore easy to distinguish by designers taxis. Vehicle types licensed for private hire however are those used by private motorists and commercial companies who carry adverts similar to those being proposed. Livery applied to private hire vehicles ensures members of the public can easily identify the cars as licensed vehicles. Uh, this fits with the primary intention of taxi law, which is to ensure and promote public safety. Prior to drafting this paper, officers received a request from a private company to allow advertising in licensed vehicles um, through in-car TV screens to display and broadcast advertising. The report contains information and factors regarding both internal and external advertising. Officers would seek prior approval um, before the advert content be used in the licensed vehicles. Uh, the content of the advertising of both non-broadcast and broadcast media is controlled through codes to promote responsible advertising and our draft policy seeks to exclude subjects of sensitive or controversial nature. On consideration, officers feel the impact that our current private hire vehicle signage has by way of the plates and door signs could be diluted by allowing external advertising and detract from the overall appearance um, of the licensed vehicles. Our recommendation is that external advertising not be permitted. As the in-car advertising does not impact upon the appearance of vehicle, officers are satisfied it would be appropriate to allow internal advertising by way of media screens in both Hackney's and private hire vehicles. Should members decide to allow any form of advertising, it is important to formally regulate advertising permissions and a draft policy is attached to Appendix 2. Depending upon tonight's decision, we'll define which sections of the draft policy are approved and what amendments need to be made to it and the related license and testing conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, for Andrew at this stage? No. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Franken. Um, when this was brought up earlier in the year, one of, uh, I think it was Councillor Fell referred that we'd have to do it because there'd be a legal challenge otherwise. I'd just like the job officers comment on that. <coughs> the local authority can set its own local conditions about in, in respect of the appearance of the vehicle and, and at the moment we don't have local conditions that permit advertising. Um, I can't see that there would be a legal challenge because we are allowed to set our own license conditions for the vehicles. Any other questions? Uh, could I just ask for, the, for clarification exactly where on the vehicles the plates uh, etc are so that we know what the statutory signage is? Yeah, on private hire vehicles um, there's a small um, front plate which is um, just below the number plate, the registration plate. Um, the rear plate uh, is double the size of the front plate and that's either adjacent to the rear number plate or below it again attached to the bumper and the door signs on vehicles can go um, on either the front side doors or the rear side doors. On minibuses um, the conditions allow them to go on the front side doors, the rear side doors or the rear quarter panel. So on cars it's the front, the, the passenger and the driver doors um, and the minibuses can also have the rear quarter panel in addition. And those signs on the side say that they have to be booked in advance. Uh, Councillor Fankham. Clarification, you say they have to be on the front or back door, they have to be at the top of the door, don't they, so they don't get dirty? <coughs> That's correct. Uh, right, um, would, would our speaker like to come forward? That's uh, Mr Dinning. Thank you. Well, don't worry about that, just tell us what you want to say. Okay, thank you. Lovely. At the last meeting, I got a, a consensus that some of the councillors wanted to move forward with part advertising. We suggested um, a restricted area of advertising, and that's we were looking for some commitment going forward. I'm not sure how it's changed. The, the, we, we thought we had some support from the officers with a restricted amount of advertising. Thank you very much. Uh, would anybody like to ask Mr. Dinning any questions? Could you just explain to in what position you are that, that speaking at this committee? Uh, currently a driver, but I also do some work for Steve uh, Kalik as Alpha Cars, uh, some business development for him. 
Thank you. Questions? Councillor Reid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Binney. Um, when you say going forward with a restricted version of the advertising, what do you have in mind? Can you explain what you think from that? Obviously, we don't want to go the full distance like the Hackneys to have a full wrap. Um, we were looking for limited advertising on the rear quarter um, and the rear door, the boot lid. Started getting into a discussion with the officers whether it should be a font size, whether it should be a colour. Uh, we said, well, okay, if we're going to advertise EE, it's not going to be a small advert, it's going to be a large advert. If we're going to advertise with an address and a website, the, 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 the font would, would change. Couldn't restrict the colour. Vodafone might change their colour. EE might change their colours. So it's, it's very difficult to define colour, font and size. But to restrict the size by the panel would be enough in our view. Um, moving the, the signs forward, dedicating a whole panel to the, the no booking, no ride sign, we, we consider to be adequate. And looking at the, the adverts here, I don't think it conflicts with the, the corporate livery. Um, and okay, we, that's what we're hoping for. Thank you. Any more questions? Could I just ask you, um, is this a consensus amongst PHV firms or is it your particular firm that's, that's requesting this? Um, not so much the firms. There are some independents who would like to advertise maybe their local restaurant or whatever, some local deal, maybe a free, free meals, some bartering. So, yeah, there, there are, there's some interest. We've, we've got a, a large car dealership who's very interested in moving forward with the, the particular vehicles. Uh, presumably on your cars you'd want to have some sort of advertisement for your own car hire company so uh, how, how would you see that playing with with some independent advertisement how, how would that not be confusing uh, that's shown on appendix one uh, there's a side view of uh, a saloon car that has third-party advertising it has the no booking no ride on a clear panel and then the operator details towards the front. That operator details could be on the bonnet, it could be anywhere really, but it would be, we, we, we suggested that it should always be a clear panel. Where there's advertising on a vehicle, we would always offer you a free panel for your um, no booking, no ride sticker, so that it, there wouldn't be any confusion. Currently, um, an operator can put the advertising right up against the no booking, no ride sticker. There's no restrictions on that. So that panel can become very cluttered. But if there's going to be advertising on there, we've asked that you stipulate a condition that there's a clear panel up and down, which I don't think is in the recommendation. So just to get it clear, then you're suggesting that there's just one panel on the side, either side, and either at the front or the back, or just the back, that you'd want advertising? It'd be the rear third of the car. So it'd be the, the rear quarters of the vehicle, as shown on that side view, and the boot, or the boot on its own. OK, so actually, when you look at the side of the car, yeah, the side of the car, as with this one, where it says City Skoda, then you've got the Basingstoke plate then you, uh, sign, then you've got your own sign. And then at the back, you've got another one. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any more questions for Mr. Dinning? Thank you very much, then. We will discuss it. Yes, please do. Um, we're going to now get talking about the, the in-car systems for advertising, etc. If that gets bogged down in specification, safety, removal of headrests, what it looks like, controls, etc., we would like you to vote on just the advertising on its own. There's, there's two options you could go for. There's advertising, which has been kicking around for about a year now, and there's the in-car systems for um, advertising. That's uh, from a different supplier, who I don't think are here tonight. Who would represent that for questions? Yes, are you saying that you... There is a draft policy that's been drawn up for, for the internal advertising, and if we do do the internal advertising, this is what we'll be looking at. Yes, you're happy with that? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, committee discussion. What do we think about advertising on PHVs? 
Councillor Jones. In general, I haven't got a problem, but I can understand where we're coming from by losing the booking sign on the sides of the vehicles. Have we looked at the actually if, the, if these vehicles want advertising, surely we should be saying, well, our sign should be bigger than any advertising, so but therefore they would pay more for a bigger sign, so therefore it stands out more. So that seems to be the crux of the problem that from what, where I'm sitting that uh, we're concerned that people getting into cars that might not be private hire or whatever. Have, has anybody looked at the fact that perhaps we could use bigger signs and it may cost the people who wish to advertise more money to put these signs on? Two-tier system. We, we don't get involved with the income that is paid to um, the proprietors for the adverts. I mean, our concern was allowing the extent that's on page 93 of 155. We're looking at, say, the, the rear third of the side of the vehicle in its entirety, which, as you say, would dominate our corporate signage. Um, our corporate signage has been in place um, for some years now, obviously approved by um, the committee and later um, withstood challenges in the court um, magistrates and, and Crown Court and we think that it works quite well as it is at the moment it's quite a nice size it's not too dominant but it does the mess it, it does the the job it's, it's proposed to do I mean primarily these are private hire vehicles they need to be easily identified wasn't asking us to get involved with how much money they get for advertising what I was saying was if they wish to advertise and I, I don't necessarily agree with the whole of the back end of the vehicle being advertised on but if they are, well, surely we should be saying our signs for our private hire should be bigger, more dominant, and perhaps something we should look at. If, it, if that's where, which way um, they're going to get more revenue in, it may cost them more money to put bigger signs on. So therefore the fear we've got is people, as I said, people getting into cars that aren't private hire or whatever. So they actually dominate the thing whereas as as it is now I, I would actually most probably vote as it was to scrap it because you can't see our signs but if that was a bigger sign on the car and it costs them more obviously there's a cost involved we won't be carrying the cost they will I just wonder whether we'd look to it from that perspective the current size of the no booking no ride signs convenient with the design of the door panel some of the door panels they're on you know they've got angles to them and they do have sort of strips through them as well so if you made them too much bigger we might be restricted on exactly where we can put those on the doors yeah we want to keep the obviously consistent across the whole fleet councillor franken um, the internal advertising i've got no problems as long as they regulate the content so i, I don't think that's an issue I've been on this committee a long time and we've looked and spent a lot of time making the private hire stand out and this is a real dangerous step of undoing some of that work. There's also the point of, with a fairly substantial basis stoke logo, it might start looking that we're, um, I can't think of the word now, endorsing, thank you, endorsing that company. So I've got real concerns about doing it, putting any external advertising on the vehicle. <coughs> Any other comments? So far, we're, we're veering towards it, it looking a bit too confused, aren't we, on, on these cars? I mean, I, I, have to, I have to sort of slightly agree. When I, when I look at this, I, uh, I mean, don't even immediately recognise that the name is the one on the right. I, for all I know, City Skoda could be the name of the car company. Um, uh, any other views? Or we'll, we'll go to, we'll, I think we'll just go to a vote if anybody else has anything further to say. No. Uh, we're just uh, yes, you're, you're quite right. We're looking at the external first of all, because obviously the internals are very. Different. So externally, um, I get I get the the view from various people that you are thinking at this stage that it will interfere with our clear signs on the cars. That as as Councillor Jones says, we've worked hard to to get right. Oh, Councillor Franken said we've worked hard to get right. Are we agreed? show of hands that we will say no to the external advertising yes thank you very much um, okay any views now on the internal advertising screens in the cars
Okay, all I've heard so, so far is from Councillor Frankham, he has no problem with that. Um, Councillor Hussey. In principle, I, d I don't object to advertising inside the car, uh, but based on the fact that there's all age ranges and whatever carried in taxes, that there should be quite stringent conditions set about what is acceptable and what isn't. And nothing like, you know, you can't have a nine o'clock watershed or whatever. Um, so if the, if, if the committee was inclined to support advertising within the, within the camps, uh, then we would have to think very carefully we don't, we, I would think we could only say in principle at this meeting this evening, and we, we need officers to go away and think very carefully about the content and then the physical safety of, of the apparatus within the, uh, within the vehicle. So I'd, I'd be happy to vote in principle in favour, but subject to much more fur further information and detail coming from the officers. Um, if you turn to page 101 um, in Appendix 2, um, there's fairly detailed conditions for advertising internally. Um, it looks quite thorough to me, but obviously, you know, if there's, if, if there's further things that you think should be added, that's fine. Um, presumably this is taken from... Okay. It, uh, uh, Andrew says it complies with all the advertising codes, and it seems to have thought of everything, including um, whether it's suitable for all ages. I don't know if you just want a few minutes just to look through it, just to see. The, the actual content of the advertising, what goes in it, is strictly controlled by um, codes. There's codes for non-broadcast and broadcast. So they're independently sort of UK regulated. Um, so everything, all the providers of these type of product would have to make sure that they're content um, complies with those codes of course that would take into account you know the watershed and uh, sensitive con uh, content of the adverts um, the rest of it has been put together based on what providers have, have given to us and across um, sort of section of um, research into other councils um, and what they um, permit by way of the media screens within taxis um, you're right obviously taxis do come in lots of different forms um, but the providers um, will make sure that their systems are appropriate for, for that type of vehicle. Right. I mean, looking at 7111 and 7112, the design must be discreet. Well, what I think is discreet and what you think is discreet, we could have a, 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 a debate on that alone. And that's what I, I think we should have much more specific uh, criteria. To me, that, that is more like a policy statement rather than a design statement. Yeah, the, the dimension of the screen is 15 inches from corner to corner. So that's, that would sort of define discrete. That would be the maximum size. They come in anything between 9 inches and, and 15 inches. Nine. But you then go on to qualify it by saying it must be discreet. You know, so it can't be six inches away from the passenger's face. <laughs> uh, I, what is discreet? I mean, I accept 719, but in my, based on what you just said, I think 7112 therefore is superfluous as a statement. Because I can't, I can't measure it and come up with the same answer as you when you measure it. We've got to come to some. Yes, thank you. Uh, we've got to come to some sort of a conclusion this evening. Can we agree that, in principle, we are in favour of internal advertising in PHVs? Yes. And officers will be happy to just perhaps take some further advice about the conditions. Good point. If there's anything specific, yes, actually, otherwise we're just going to extend this out further and further. Specifically, you're concerned about exactly what the screen looks like and where it's positioned, is that correct? I'd be happy to have my own private meeting with one of the officers and go through in more detail, if that would help. It might help me, it might not help you. <laughs> I think we need to come to conclusion in committee rather than um, uh, leave it out just for you. Um, is there anything in, in specifically that's concerning you or anybody else? I mean, I personally read through these and I have to say I think they look fine by me. 
Um, the, only, the only slight thing I would say is where it says the driver must have overall control of the volume. I immediately think of him sort of twisting around and trying to turn the volume around. Perhaps you could just say at, at, at his, at their purpose-built ones that are at his wheel, etc. Um, is there anybody apart from Councillor Hussey who feels that they would like to adjust or amend any of the conditions that are put on page 101 and 102? No? Do you mind being overruled on this one, Councillor Hussey? Okay. Okay. So, um, are we all agreed, therefore, that we will say yes to intern advertising with the conditions that are stated in the order paper? Yes? Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Right. So, it's no to external, yes to internal. Let's now move on to the next, um, which is paper C, licensing fees and charges, and Linda will introduce this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. Um, I hope members have got a copy, a large copy of the appendices to this report. I'm afraid they didn't reproduce particularly well in the report, so I've produced those to make life a bit easier for you. Um, it's that time of year again where we're going to be looking at fees and charges for next year. Um, so we're recommending that the committee approve the charges as set out in the report. And just for some additional clarity, um, the taxi and private hire fees and the scrap metal dealers, we just want to refer them up to Cabinet as well, for subject to your approval tonight. I didn't put that in the report, that was my mistake. Um, the budget strategy across the Council for this year is calculated to achieve an increase of 2% um, across all fees and charges. I've looked at all the fees and I've rounded them up or down because we didn't want odd silly pennies. It's, it's, it's um, easier to have whole figures. So you will see that some are slightly above the 2% and some are slightly below, but overall the increase equates to 2%. Appendix 1 sets out the current and proposed Basingstoke and Dean Hackney carriage fees along with most of the Hampshire fees. Bear in mind the Hampshire fees are the current fees. There's no proposed for next year because they haven't done theirs yet. So we're not quite comparing like with like. Appendix 2 lists the current and the proposed fees to be charged for the other licensing functions. And the Appendix 3 lists current and proposed fees for Gambling Act licenses, again with the Hampshire fees attached. We're still waiting um, locally set fees to come from central government. Uh, we've been promised this for two years now and we're still waiting. And hot off the press from the Home Office last week is that the paper is still on the Home Office desk. So it's still being looked at, and that's as most as I could get out of them. Licence fees must be set on a cost recovery basis. There are certain things that we can include and certain things that we can't. Um, certain enforcement activities have to come from the council central pot. Um, some fees will only cover the cost of administration. Um, what we can't do is make a profit, and we can't um, s support other licensing services from our licence fees. Um, and if we don't increase our fees in line with the costs, this results in an increased financial loss to the council and an increase in the council's current subsidy of the licensing service. We did propose this year to do a complete and thorough review of all our fees. Um, that was based on awaiting the regulations from central government which were due out last year. We're still waiting. Um, in addition to that, there is, you may be aware, there's a High Court case that is now sitting in the Supreme Court uh, which is Westminster Council v Hemmings, um, looking at sex establishment licensing fees. Um, we're still awaiting the outcome of that, and I think nationally that will have an impact on how fees are set across the country. It's waiting to go into the Supreme Court. So ba based on the fact that we're waiting for that court decision and for government guidance on locally setting licensing act fees, we've had to again defer the detailed um, consideration of our fees. Uh, we had hoped to have had it finished and reported to you by now, but it seems daft doing it and then something comes out of the Supreme Court and we have to do it all over again because um, I'm sure the, the trades don't want their fees changed three or four times in the period of a year. Um, you will see later we're talking about a potential shared service. Again, if that goes ahead, we would have to look at the cost of issuing licenses under a shared service, which we hopefully will become more competitive. So that would be, that's three good reasons just to defer for a little bit longer before we carry out the full fees review. Hence the decision just to put them up in line with the inflation costs, um, in line with the budget strategy. Um, the only risks really that we don't cover our costs, well we don't cover our costs currently, certainly with the Hackney Carriage Licensing Budget, we do subsidise that. Bearing in mind some of that subsidy is to cover the enforcement, which they, they, they doesn't come out of the fees. 
Um, I've mentioned here the European Services Directive. This is what the Hemmings case is all about because when that came into force in 2009, it changed the Europe said that we could only charge for certain things out of licensing fees, whereas the legislation that came out before it says we could charge for things that the European Services Directive says we now can't, which is why it's gone all the way to the Supreme Court. And that will be the final decision. And I think that's what the government are waiting for in order to set, decide how we're going to locally set fees. So we're waiting for a lot, quite a lot to go on. Um, so as per the report, we've just increased the fees by 2%, roughly. Um, if you've got any questions, then please do come back to me. Thank you. Councillor Fankham. Just a quick comment. In the past, we used to have a percentage change. Like, so I'd sit there and work it out in my head, so my head hurt uh, for a while. So if we can have that in the future ones, it'd be helpful. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Just out of interest, um, we've got a paper coming up about heart. There's nothing in there for heart at all. Is there, is there a reason? You know, and Winchester, which is a neighbouring borough, it would be they're the ones we, if this thing ever did blow up, the people are competing against each other. We'd like to. The reason is, despite my nagging and pleading and saying please many, many times, they've not provided me with that information. Any other questions on fees and charges? Any comments, points of discussion, queries, etc.? I think we're, we're in a similar position to last year, really. We're, we're sort of still waiting for some definitive guidelines from the government, which means that, you know, we're, we're, and also, of course, we're, when, once we, if, if we join with Hart, then that's obviously going to change matters again and we have to look at them. So it seems that there'll be a much more comprehensive review next year. And let's hope it actually is next year this time. <laughs> and since Councillor Frankham has worked out in his head that the 2% is pretty much adhered to, I had to use a calculator, but I agree with you. <laughs> I couldn't do it in my head. Um, are we happy to approve the increase in fees and charges? Yes, all agreed? Thank you very much. Ooh, getting through nice and quickly. Right, let's move on now to paper E. Uh, this is an update on private hire and enforcement. Uh, Linda. Thank you. Um, members asked for us to report back um, at least annually on the enforcement activity, in particular um, in relation to private hire and taxi. And so this report sets out what the team have been up to since last October. I don't think I need to go into too much detail because it's all in the tables at the end. Um, but really just a summary that we have a very good working relationship with the um, are they Safer Neighbourhood team now. We used to call them the Traffic Police, but they've got Safer Neighbourhood team, I think they're called now. Um, and we try and get out at least twice a year into the Timberlake Tunnel for the planned operations where we work with the DVSA officers, Traffic Police, um, Fraud Investigation team, and do a one-stop shop for all the checks. And that works very well. It's undercover, it's dry, the trade are very cooperative. Um, quite often if an operator, a vehicle gets called in, he phones his operator and the operator sends all the rest of the vehicles that are out down to us. One or two do a sudden disappearing act as well. That's, a, that's not quite uncommon. Um, so we've done that twice this year and that is summarised in the tables. We've also done other routine enforcement um, where we've been out and we've checked things while we're out. Um, there's a couple of early morning checks that have been done as well. And particularly in response to complaints and allegations, we, we try and respond to all of the complaints and allegations that come in where we are the appropriate person to deal with it. Some of the complaints come in about being overcharged or whatever. Um, that's a contractual issue between the driver and the customer, unless it's on a, a metered hackney carriage, of course. Um, and we've had reason to take action against particular drivers for driving matters and other issues. Um, and we always follow out the council's enforcement policy when we come to those decisions. We think that uh, the compliance checks are an essential tool to establish the correct use of the licenses and it keeps us out there getting to know our trade. Um, this type of enforcement, the compliance checking element of it is covered from the licensing fees, but any action we take such as suspension, revocations, prosecutions, etc., cannot be covered from licensing fees. So all the compliance checks and going out with the police is covered. 
Um, I think the risks speak for themselves. If we don't go out there and keep an eye on things, we're not always entirely sure what is going on. So it's really good practice for us to get out there and meet with the trade. Um, we keep up to date with the trade through our newsletter um, so they know what we're doing and where we're going and who's been a naughty boy or girl. So we like, like to keep them informed of what we're doing. So really, unless there's any questions, this paper's really just for noting, but I'm happy to take questions if needed. Councillor Frankham. Uh, just a standard one I do around reading this report out. I'd really like to come and observe one day when you're doing these enforcements, because I, I think I, I'd really like to put the whole picture in my head. I think it could be quite a useful training tool for me to see the, the actions you're actually taking. <coughs> Any other questions for Linda? Could I just ask one question? Um, obviously, you say that sometimes you do take quite serious action if there's a, a serious breach. Do you have any power to have uh, give fines or penalties? What What's the deterrent when you find something wrong? If it's serious, the vehicle's taken off the road. If it's a serious vehicle defect, if it's the driver, they get to, not wearing their badge, they get sent home to collect to get their badge, and they, we tell the operator to take them off the system. Um, obviously, something more serious, such as not having a, renewed their license or whatever, we've got other sanctions we can take. Um, and Andy has just reminded me that Mr. Galuli wants to speak on this paper. Yeah, sorry. I yes. yes, we'd all forgot. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, there are various sanctions. Um, we've been quite busy this year in terms of drivers. We've revoked a couple and we've suspended a couple, and um, that's kept us busy as well, as, as it's kept the members busy as well at subcommittees. But you don't have any power to charge fines for any of them? Not at the moment, but the Law Commission proposals, when the, they decide whether that's going to come in, is that there will be potential for accredited officers to issue fixed penalty notices mm. for things like bull tires and that sort of thing. But mm. currently, the outcome of the Law Commission review hasn't appeared at any of the political parties' um, annual conferences. So we don't know if it's going to appear in any of the manifestos for next year's elections. Mm. If it doesn't, then it's unlikely to happen, I would suggest. Okay. But we're optimistic. Uh, it just seems sensible to me. It's a, it's a way of raising revenue in order to do more enforcements, and uh, it just seems that there's a deterrent there, that you're not just sent home to get your badge or whatever, but there's something slightly more um, impacting. Um, are those all the questions for Linda? Yes, Councillor Frankham. Uh, um, I've reported several times when I've seen what I think is bad driving, smoking in the cab. What things should we be looking at and reporting to officers as members? might be useful for other members to know as well. For instance, if the door badge is at the bottom for no book, no ride, then it should be reported. If it's tatty, we should report it so they can get a fresh one. What sort of things around that? Yeah, agreed. Anything that you see that doesn't look right. Um, you've reported a couple of dangerous driving, which um, as have other members and many, many members of the public. We have reports of damage to vehicles, dents, broken windows, plates in the rear window instead of on the back. Um, <clears throat> one of the members of the trade is quite... Um, uh, vociferous at reporting things that are seen on, on other vehicles so anything that you think is is inappropriate or non-compliant we would be very happy to hear about because we can't be out in 250 square miles of borough seven days a week so thank you for that thank you very much mr galuli would you like to come and uh, say what you want to thank you and just say what capacity you're here My name is Mick Galuli. I'm a Hackney carriage owner driver in Basingstoke. Um, I just have a few issues with some of the, the things that are down on the enforcement sheet. Um, in particular, the lack of tariff cards in Hackney carriage. And I, I don't know if you're, you're all aware, but this is the format. This is what exists in a Hackney carriage as a tariff card. These are placed on the back door in the rear compartment down at floor level. Um, it can't be read by customers and are very hard to understand by the average customer, by some of the drivers also. Um, about three years ago, I suggested and I provided um, copies of a system that Transport for London have been using, which is a sticker that goes next to the passenger in the rear quarter light. Um, it incorporates a wheelchair sign for disabled ac access. It incorporates um, a no smoking sign. Uh, they are compulsory in London, but it also incorporates um, an abbreviated tar tariff card. For instance, the, the meter will start at £3. After the first mile, it will go up to £3.60. Very abbreviated and a lot more 
easy to understand than this one. I'd just like to know, um, is this ever going to be incorporated or adopted? I mean, it was over three years ago. I suggested and provided pictures of it to the licensing department. They sounded quite enthusiastic about it at the time. Um, has this been forgotten about? Or? Um, I, prob probably not ideal to just ask questions and expect them to answer on the spot, but um, I'll let them answer if they want to. But obviously your comments have been noted, I'm sure. Just to say, Mick, that we apologise for the delay, but events have overtaken us with workloads and things, but we'll certainly add it in for this year's work plan to look at it. So if you might need to send us the information again, please. So apologies. Okay, thank you. I did try and get a copy of one from Transport for London, but they wouldn't provide it to me because I'm not a licensed hackney carriage driver in London, but however, I will try again. Um, the other thing that I just thought I'd pick up is on is um, inconsiderate excessive parking in North Hans Hospital taxi bays. Um, myself and lots of my colleagues are constantly emailing the licensing team about excessive inconsiderate parking outside private hire offices, double parking on double yellow lines, drivers in the vehicles, engines running, lights on, on double yellow lines. Why is this never included in the enforcement and when the land that a hospital is included in the enforcement? To me it seems a bigger problem in a public area on a major thoroughfare on the way out of town where private hire cars are making a self available for immediate hire? Um, the issue with the yellow lines outside the base, the um, operating space, is we have no enforcement power on yellow lines. It's down to parking enforcement. So much as we see it as annoyance, we do refer it on to our parking team and we say, could you please keep an eye on that? But clearly they've got 250 square miles to look at. I take your point entirely but we have no enforcement powers on W lines so we, we could say what we like to them and they could just choose to ignore us because we have no authority. In terms of the hospital we don't do enforcement at the hospital this is in response to complaints. The issue with the bays of the hospital is that they were designed to help both trades deliver and collect passengers from the hospital. There is no traffic order on those and you will know from yourselves that the hospital last year sometime completely relayed all the bays and made them look very different. It's hospital land, it's private, it's controlled by the hospital parking attendants. We just ring them occasionally and say, look, this is causing a problem, could you please just keep an eye on it? But we have no power to ask them to do that. We just ask them out of sort of anticipation, really. But there is no traffic orders on those bays. They're completely owned by the hospital. So any issues with those, we pass back to the hospital. But, but we think it's inconsiderate if a driver spends four hours parked in a bay because he's gone in for his hospital appointment. That is just not using them for what they were designed, but we have no authority to enforce on there. All those comments about the hospital are based on complaints. Have you made the two comments you want to? Um, just, just, just sort of, I mean, obviously you do recognise that this sort of conversation you can have not in a committee meeting. Um, so if there's anything else that you'd like to say in the context of the committee meeting, please do. But obviously, if not, you can always lobby the Parking Enforcement Department about that particular issue. Is there any more you wish to say to the committee? No? Okay, thank you for coming along, though. It's been very interesting. Um, are we agree? Uh, anybody want to make any comments? No? I think it sounds like everyone's well on top of enforcement issues. So the report is noted, correct? Okay, thank you. And we move on to paper D which is um, a provision for a shared licensing service with Hart District Council. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, this, this, is comp this report is for members to note. Um, just going back through the history, um, earlier this year, Hart District Council approached Basingstoke and Dean to consider the benefit of a shared service, shared licensing service. Um, the main driver for Hart was succession planning and resilience because they're a very small team over there. Um, at that time, we were still undergoing our um, efficiencies and savings review um, here that all the council departments went through. We were one of the last to, to go through that. Um, and the consideration for a shared service was one of the outcomes of that efficiencies and savings review. You will be aware that we already have a shared legal services with Hart, and that's been going successfully for some five or six years now, 2008 I think it was, so probably six years. And in 2010 I actually provided some management support to Hart when they had a period of sickness. 
Um, we had some early discussions with them and we identified the key benefits to both authorities and they're set out in paragraph 3.5 and in 3.6 and in discussion with the officers at heart we have identified some initial short-term challenges um, which involve the need for a transitional period because obviously they have different procedures, they have different IT systems, they have different customer service levels um, and there was going to be some challenges there in the early days um, and both, both parties agreed that they weren't insurmountable. Um, we've also looked at a potential longer term strategy um, to do with policies. Clearly Hart District is very different to Bays and Stoke but maybe our policy aims would be very similar. So there is a potential to have shared licensing policies but with appendices to reflect the local geog geographical issues and sort of economic issues where Hart is a very different looking borough to ours. Um, we, would ape, we were aiming for a, a one-stop shop, so if a dr Hart driver lived in Basingstoke, what's to stop him coming into our office, offices to do his DBS um, interview? Um, and one of the biggest aims for us is to incre increase the online opportunities. I've always said utopia for me would be a Hackney carriage driver sitting on the rank with his smartphone applying for his license whilst waiting for the next passenger. So they don't have to come in here and hand the paperwork in and all the rest of it. So that's utopia for me is to increase the online capabilities. They don't want to waste their time coming into the offices. So that's some of the longer term strategies. Um, we looked at the workloads. Um, they don't do the breadth of work that we do. Um, but when comparing the similar functions, the heart workload amounts to about 55% of ours. But that's as of last year's the transaction numbers. Um, the proposal is that I will manage both teams. I say both teams because it would be just one team, just working across two boroughs um, and I'll have some management support across both boroughs from Andrew and the licensing officers who do the high risk stuff, the more serious inspections and complaints will have two at Basingstoke and one at Hart and those, those could swap across. Um, we will cover Hart committees, myself and Andy. Um, there'll be a, a presence at Hart because currently they have a lot of walk-in trade over there. Um, and there'll be a bigger presence here and at long term we may have a, a, a hub here to do most of the work once we've got the online systems in place and the ability to apply to a central place. Hart Council have endorsed it last two weeks ago at their shared services, at their licensing committee. Um, under the implications, gonna, two staff will transfer to Hart under Chupi and the senior officer over there is looking to retire so that's timely for, our, for his benefit. And Hart Council will make a contribution towards the management costs here. Um, the proposal is to have a, pro a project officer for a year to deal with the transitional arrangements, having somebody taken out of the day job to look at IT, look at policies, procedures, best practice, um, because we wouldn't have time to do that and do our day job. And Hart have agreed to support that post for the first year, 80% um, of that post. Um, and the only additional payments will be as and when staff get pay rises, which isn't very often at the moment, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and we're looking at three years sort of commitment to start with, with the anticipation that it will continue. Um, the HR issues speak for themselves in terms of the GP transfers. Um, we'd be looking at um, recruiting a licensing apprentice both here and at heart, because the recruitment apprentices has become very popular now, and they can get some really good experience in local authority. There will be a legal deed set up um, to set out the basis of the contract. Portfolio holder, um, Councillor Ekus has stated that um, creating a shared licensing service between Basingstoke and Dean and Hart District Council, we are able to build on the already successful shared legal service between the two councils, continue to streamline the borough's services and reduce overall costs. But key to this is the improvement that we expect in staff morale and the retention and development of experienced staff. So that will be going separately as well as a portfolio holder report um, through the usual route. Um, this, po this report is for information, but I am happy to take questions if you have any. Uh, Councillor Frankham. Um, what time day, day or evening do Hart meet for appeals and for their licensing committee? The reason I ask, we have our appeals during the day to try and stop you from having to work in the evenings as much. Um, if you've got more work in the evening, that's less time you have to do enforcement in the evening because that's the main time you're going to be doing it. I just wonder what the implications of the out-of-hours work extra will be put on the team. 
um, most of the evening committees I will cover um, and they are usually Tuesdays like we have here so we don't often do enforcement on a Tuesday night for taxis particularly because it's not a busy night if you're going to go out you've got to try and get as many as you can uh, it, to, to come through the system a lot of their hearings for the subcommittees are done during the day as they are here we'll have an officer based at heart so that officer can cover them as they would if they were based here so we because we cover the daytime hearings ourselves here and it would be the same at heart does that answer your question any more questions or comments this is obviously just for noting we're not required to endorse it it's being dealt with by the portfolio holder uh, yes councillor jones if there's a conflict in policy between Ways and Sutton and Dean and Hart, I, I assume they would be remain separate in as much as we've been talking about advertising, for instance, they may advertise, we may not. Yeah, there wouldn't be no interaction across the taxi services, and it's just the administration. Hmm. And just for clarity, that there'll be two separate licensing committees and the subcommittees will be meeting in two different locations. Yes? Okay, thank you. Any other comments? I'd just like to comment on the sheer optimism of this report. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> I, I, 3.14 says, subject to the installation of the necessary IT support, all officers will eventually be able to work seamlessly at both locations. It's just I'm going to be a dream. <laughs> yes, no, it's very optimistic, but very interesting as well. So um, com the, the report is noted, correct. Okay, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Uh, now we move on to uh, the animal situation. Um, paper B, the adoption of revised cat boarding model standard license con conditions. And this one is again. Linda again. Thank you. Thank you. Me again. Um, Ever so often, the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health uh, meet with relevant parties and decide on new modern conditions for licensed boarding establishments. <coughs> You'll be aware that we licensed catteries and kennels under the 1963 Animal Boarding Establishments Act, and local authorities can set conditions to secure the health, safety and welfare of the animals being cared for. The Chartered Institute of Environmental Health have produced new conditions. Um, we've looked at them. We think they're pretty good. We've consulted with all the current cattery licensees and there was only one comment about the requirement to weigh cats. Well, I think that's a bit over the top, but the guidance just says they need to monitor the weight and we think they could do that without having to put them on the scales, unless they, perhaps they were going to be there for six months if somebody was going away. But it's overall that we only had the one comment, so it is our recommendation that from the start of the new licensing season next year, that um, we adopt these conditions from the 1st of January for the new licenses and the renewals. Any questions from people who know about these things? Oh, Councillor Hood. Thank you, Chair. Isn't it ironic that um, under DC, we used to give planning permission for cat trees and kennels and stuff like that. So do you, obviously, do you work very closely with our officers in DC, or is it now a separate identity? <laughs> Uh, usually when a planning application comes in they'll usually remember to let us know but usually we've had the inquiry before the planning application comes in so we will always say you're going to need planning permission so we suggest you make your application first rather than make your application to us so there is a dialogue between the two teams often through the applicant but in nine times out of ten that does get covered yes Thank you. Any more questions? It's always a tension, isn't it, between DC and licensing. I remember there was one situation where they got their license. It wasn't a cattery, it was an alcohol license, but they were turned down at DC, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, any more questions? If not, any comments? Would anybody have any comments about this? No? I think, yes, I think, uh, I mean, obviously the CIEH have got some expert people preparing these things. They know far more than I do about how cats should be living. So um, are we happy then to agree the recommendation, which is to adopt the new set of cattery licensing conditions and to allow officers to agree on a reasonable time period for compliance where major changes are required. Are we agreed? agreed. Yes, thank you very much. Now we move to dogs. Um, <laughs> oh, it's a great variety. Uh, paper G, which is towards the end of the report, page 104. And this, I believe, is Karen to introduce. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, right, this, is, this report is to enable members to consider the introduction of standard licence conditions, again for boarding establishments, but this is to operate a creche or day centre uh, for dogs. The boarding of dogs is covered under the Animal Boarding Establishment Act, and the licence is required if the business is operating, providing accommodation for dogs day or night. And the Act requires such businesses to provide suitable accommodation and sets minimum standards for the health, safety and welfare of the dogs. Conditions can be set by the local authority to ensure those minimum standards are set. So we've already got standard licence conditions which again are set in line with the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. We've got those for commercial kennels which were Appendix 1. And then we've got conditions for boarding of the dogs in the home as well which was approved by the Licensing Committee in September 2009. That was as a result of an increase in demand for boarding dogs in domestic premises, which is at Appendix 2. In the borough at the moment, we've currently got licensed two commercial dog kennels, and we've got 22 home boarding establishments. We've recently had inquiries about providing daytime accommodation for dogs, this time in daycare centres or creche-type facilities, where there's large numbers of dogs are being looked after together. They're provided with rest areas, play areas, exercise areas, and they're supervised in a safe and fun environment, is how they describe it. So due to the very different nature of this sort of accommodation, they would be unable to comply with the conditions that we've got currently for commercial or home boarding, um, so they couldn't be licensed. So we've researched, um, because of the increase in this type of boarding facility, we've researched and found other councils are already licensing these sort of premises. So following discussions with those, and based on our current home and commercial kennel conditions, we've got proposed conditions here today for this type of dog daycare crash facility, um, which are attached to Appendix 3. So if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any questions for Karen? No? I think we're all looking a little bit bemused by this, really, to be honest with you. Um, I think once again this has been prepared by people who know far more than I do about what dogs require in their creche. Um, can I assume that we're happy to accept um, the proposed conditions at Appendix 3? Yes? Three. Thank you very much. Um, well, we're whizzing through the agenda tonight. That, means that only leaves us to look at the... I, th I think she's probably gone, actually. Yeah, because we're only just yeah, looking at... Gone. Oh, well, she's left her bag. I think she was going, actually. That's yeah. my bag. Oh, it's oh, Rita's. Okay. It's, all right. it's all right, David. She's gone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he's dancing the hokey-cokey with his wheelchair. Um, no, literally, we've just got to comment on the subcommittee decisions, but I'm really pleased to see that we've got the entire decisions at the back of the report. So... Um, there's nothing more to say but just to comment that they're there so that you can see exactly what decisions the subcommittees have been making, which is very helpful. Um, I just wanted to say one thing which has been a concern to me for some time, and that is to just be aware that for new licenses or, or variations that come to subcommittees, we do have five days to prepare our decision. And uh, obviously so, some of the shorter decisions we can do on the spot and call people back in. But I know for me, I've kept people waiting for hours, waiting for us to make sure we've got the conditions exactly right, et cetera, et cetera. And then we still find that we haven't quite worded it right. So do be aware that we can actually defer our decision so that we get it absolutely right. And uh, we can discuss, on, discuss the, the broad decision that we're going to make, but then take a bit of time over the finer details. Okay, any other comments? Yes, Councillor Franklin. Just to say, we can also bring everyone back in and say this is what we're minded to do. Is there any problems with that to make sure that we get it right then? We've done it a couple of times. I think it could be quite useful if there's a lot of complicated um, conditions. Because in the past when we've done that, there was a couple of conditions and pointless being on there. And um, then the canon said, probably best just to remove it. We did try and start rewriting again, I just remove it. So I, 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 I do, do think so. And if there's any, dis is there a point at which the officers can come back on these decision notices and say, well, that's difficult, so it improves our learning and our understanding, well, that's not going to work. Because, for instance, we quite often put on, you should have um, CCTV signages available. Well, under the Data Protection Act, not only should you have that, you should have who the data controller is, the purpose of the CCTV, who to contact, the telephone number. So it's not sufficient to cover other legislation. Although that legislation covers it, we put a condition on that's really unhelpful compared to that. So the, I think there's a lot of learning to be done 
around conditions because they for instance and if you do like fire extinguishers at times well that's the fire authority so whether they're really necessary on there i know sometimes it's good to reinforce but at some point i think the officers should take the opportunity whether these are here to say well how do you know this is this is wrong so that we learn whether we do it in a private session or not because i always want to improve so i, I just wonder what you thought that um, I think the idea that we've talked about before about if there's anything that's going to be a bit contentious you come back and say we're minded to do this that's great because the legal advisor can can talk a bit about how you've arrived at that and as officers we can say in our professional opinion we think that there will be a conflict here or it won't work because or this word should be changed we can't tell you what the conditions could be but we we are we are okay as long as we're still sitting on our little fence in the middle in our impartial role to say you might members might like to consider wording it this way or that way or members might have like to have regard to the comments made by the police which be, is a particular issue and and word of conditions in in such a way that sorts that out i will just add that the institute of licensing have been working on a set of model conditions or pool of conditions for members to draw on um as long as they're case by case specific so that the wording nationally becomes a bit more consistent as well we're still wait, <coughs> waiting on that, but that's the Institute of Licensing, not central government, so we might get it a bit quicker. Um, but yeah, I think that the, anything that's contentious is really useful to come back out and say, well, we're minded to do this, because we might find it's totally disproportionate because there's something we hadn't thought of, or the, the applicant might say, well, that's going to cost me thousands just to fix something that's very small. So yeah, I think that's a really good idea, and we're always happy to support that. I can't find it now that there was one that said, we will put a noise limiter in, for instance. Well, set so at what level? What's it, you know, yeah, uh, things like that. Uh, yeah, so the conditions like that, I couldn't find it. I remember reading it earlier in the year on the one I wasn't on. So, <clears throat> things like that is, I think, as a committee, we need to know that just putting put a, a noise limit in one, they are expensive, so that could be a condition that's too onerous, and, and two, that it, it needs to have a level set, otherwise, it's pretty pointless, it's no more than a volume control. I mean, this is probably a situation where you probably could have your five days so that you do actually get it right and the licensing team have a chance to look through it a little, little bit more finely and can pick up on some of the things. But I mean, I do feel that we get our broad training very nice where we have, have everything thrown at us for an afternoon by some professional, but then we're thrown in the deep end and, and it takes a long time, doesn't it, to really get to grips with conditions, etc, etc. But uh, I think we just have to learn that by experience. Um, any other comments on subcommittee work? I think there are quite a few coming up, and thank you for everyone who's volunteered. It's really, it's really good to have a committee of 12 now that we can draw on. Yeah, it'd be nice to have you back. Uh, so at this stage, I think we will declare this meeting over. Thank you very much. Okay.